I remember the first time I heard you speak about cultures that live from the salmon, like the indigenous people who that's how they survive is they eat the salmon. And because of that, their relationship, you know, they get their water from a stream. So of course their relationship to the salmon in the stream is very different than someone who goes and buys their water in a bottle or gets it from a tap or gets it from, so, you know, one person is really invested in the systems that keep them alive. And the other is invested in the connection to the species and the animals and the nature and the earth. And I, when I heard you express that, it gave language to a grief that I had not known I had really. I mean, it was always there, but I didn't, when you labeled it, I did feel this, it was almost like a sense of jealousy or envy of like, oh yeah, like no wonder they fight for it so much more than I do. I wish I was more connected to, you know, whatever it was and whatever it is. So when you talk about the, the sorrows, is that part of what you mean? Oh, absolutely. That's that's a fundamental part of it. You know, when we when we shifted to an individualistic ground, that uh, self interested ground, we lost all kinds of intimacies. There's a beautiful passage I think I may have shared by Paul Shepard, who was a he called himself a human biologist, looking at our own evolutionary story and uh, what were we shaped for, and what are we actually living. But he was being interviewed once, and I forget the question, but his response was, the grief and sense of loss that we often attribute to a failure in our personality is actually a feeling of emptiness where a beautiful and strange otherness was meant to be encountered. So just think about that. When we stop talking to salmon, when we stop talking to wren and meadowlark, and when we stop speaking to the trees, we begin to feel that emptiness. I mean, there's that emptiness again. Shepard's also talking about that. It's actually an emptiness where a beautiful and strange otherness should have been encountered. We're supposed to be in conversation with the living world as a participant. And this is what, you know, initiation practices, they were meant to break us open to the widest possible identity so that I wasn't protecting the salmon out of an altruism, but out of a sense of affinity. That's my body in fish form. I'm their body in upright walking form. You know, that that kinship relationship was profound. And there wasn't a sense of, you know, so much of that separate separation, but a sense of mysteriously entangled existences. That's why the cave paintings are so powerful. They, they're depicting these beings of grandeur. And they weren't human paintings very often. They're mostly of the beings that they were around, sacramental. So yes, it's a profound sense of grief that we carry by basically reducing our conversation to one species. Yeah, that's interesting, especially because that becomes, you know, there's so much language in the psychological world, especially in social media's conversation of psychology about narcissism. And uh, it's interesting when we're within a culture of narcissism and then we wonder why we're attracted to narcissists, you know, <laughs> like it's a, it's the, the irony is not lost upon me. For people listening who maybe not be familiar with the word initiation, maybe we could start with defining that and, and then exploring how we might know we've found ourselves in one. And before we even do that, and maybe this is just part of your answer, I'm wondering, is there a, a line between like a life's you know, challenge and an initiation are, are all life challenges initiations. I think any significant encounter that alters your sense of being in the world has the potential for being initiatory. A divorce, a death of someone close, um, an illness, a deep depression, you know, whatever it is that you encounter, even falling in love has a way of unraveling an old identity, hopefully. That's the, I mean, these are all possibilities. There is no guarantee that you're ever going to get through an initiation. The invitations are there always from psyche, from soul, to take whatever the encounter is and to digest that in terms of a radical alteration in being. But as I said in the series, you know, everything can be laid out in front of you and you can still miss the bus. It doesn't mean it's going to happen. The work has to be engaged. In other words, Whatever the event that happens in your life, 
like I say, whether it's a divorce or a death or whatever, I, I'm not there just to simply endure that experience, but to have it undo me. And I have to participate in that process of disintegration. All initiatory events have as one of its foundational elements, death. Something must die. An old identity, an old pattern, an old fixation, an old strategy. There is no initiation without a death involved in it. And we are so, again, self-oriented. I cling to everything and I hold on tight as if the loss of that pattern might put me in a place of, of not being able to control or manage my world, which is terrifying when you're basically trying to fit in and get approved of. You don't want to lose control. But initiation's all about that. 